In this episode, we speak with Guillaume Patty, a high school math teacher from Quebec City, Quebec. Guillaume has transformed his assessment and evaluation process over the years to move away from overemphasizing grades and focusing more on the attention for growth. Guillaume is struggling with uh, how to determine what uh, what should impact and influence both the feedback and grade for a specific standard when an error or a misconception is not directly related to the learning goal of focus. Listen in as we help Guillaume weed through what really matters in his assessment evaluation process by breaking down uh, the things that he's doing in his classroom so we can build them back up. My friends, this is another Math Mentoring Moment episode where we speak with a member of the Math Moment Maker community just like you. And together we brainstorm strategies and next steps for teachers to overcome those pebbles that they have kicking around in those shoes. Let's not waste any time. Let's dig in with Guillaume. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. We are two math teachers from makemathmoments.com who together with you, the community of math moment makers worldwide who want to build and deliver problem-based math lessons that spark curiosity, fuel sense-making, and ignite your teacher moves. Welcome, everyone, to another Math Mentoring Moment episode. These are some of our favorite, mm -hmm. favorite episodes because we get to sit down with friends just like you, and we get to chat about those pebbles that are shaking around in your shoes. Uh, before we get going here, I want you to just take a moment and pause. And uh, if you've got a pebble in that shoe head on over to makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor so you can share a short couple lines about your current pebble. And uh, hey, maybe we can get you on so we can have a conversation about that one. Uh, John, this discussion here with Guillaume is great. First off, uh, my, my thinking here after just hanging up the call with him is that first of all, super committed, dedicated, and really wants mm -hmm. obviously all of his students to grow and and sort of shine as mathematicians in his math class. What are your thoughts here to just set us up for this episode as we dig in? Yeah, he's he's made a, he's made some great changes in his classroom practices over you know the course of his career. You know, getting to this this place uh, where he's focusing on feedback uh, for growth. Uh, he's 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 taken the ideas. Uh, uh, of a standards-based grade in and applied them specifically uh, to help our, his students kind of see that growth is important and he's eliminated his grades to help do that. Now, he the interesting thing here, Kyle, is that a lot of the practices he's put in place is, is, is actually what we teach over in the assessment for growth course, mm -hmm. uh, which we built a course on uh, how we use assessment in our classes uh, to do the same thing that Guillaume is doing. So uh, um, that course we'll share after the episode is over. But, uh, you know, he's doing a lot of the things that we teach and which is amazing to see that he's kind of come a long way with those things. Uh, but let's get into it. Let's talk. Uh, let's let's let our listeners here hear uh, Guillaume talk about his struggle around kind of, uh, uh, you know, how do I how do I filter out the real thing I want to look at versus, you know, all these other things that contribute to success in the math class. So uh, let's hear Guillaume and uh, let's get right to the conversation. Here we go. Hey there, Guillaume. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us here on the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me. Awesome. I awesome. We would we are honored to have you and chat with you. And we're excited to dig into some of the ideas that, you know, what's going on in your classroom and hope uh, hopefully we can brainstorm some stuff here. Guillaume, uh, fill us in on some details here before we get started. Let us uh, let us and our listeners know where you're coming from. Um, I, I know some of them are like, oh, I hear an, I heard an accent. I heard an accent. Yeah. So let us know uh, where you're coming from and uh, what, what your current teaching role is. And then maybe a little bit of backstory of how you got into that teaching role. All right. So I come from Quebec City in Quebec. So uh, English is not my uh, first language. So I hope that everyone's going to uh, understand if I do some mistakes when I speak. 
Uh, I teach what would be grade 10. Um, mm -hmm. And in Quebec, in each year, we teach every subject. So that's that means that that's that there is no only not only one subject for the, the year. So uh, and I teach in a uh, special program where I teach both math, science, basic science and advanced science to the same kids. Oh, wow. uh, so I see the kids 12 times every nine days. So I have sometimes I have a mm. half of day with the kids. So that allows me to do more, uh, more stuff that we don't want to do because it takes a lot of material or uh, lots of time. Because like today I was uh -huh. having a, a two day, a two period class with my students. So that means that two hour and a half class with them. So we did uh, some, uh, um, we were working on ballistic, so they were they were using a ramp, and they had to uh, calculate where the marble would land exactly when mm. it was using the, the ramp. So it's lot. It needs more stuff than what we used to in a in a math class. But since I had two classes in a row, it was easy for me to have them work on those ramp and use them afterwards. I love it. I love it. That sounds so interesting. It's such a, a, a unique structure um, for your classes. So I'm I'm sure probably you're used to it, but I'm in my head, I was picturing you're like, you know, you see them, I think you said 12 times every nine days or or something along those lines. So I'm sure there's a bit of a rotating sort of exactly. schedule going on. That's probably a little bit hectic for you and maybe even the students to sort of keep track of. But uh, once that routine gets going, I'm sure it's uh, it's really helpful um, just to have, it, it sounds like different block lengths, right? You had those half days. And then what would be your shortest period out of curiosity? So the shortest time length that you're with it's students? 70 minutes or twice 70 minutes. Got it. Got it. Awesome. So here in Ontario, we do 75 minute periods. So that would be like, you know, one or two periods together, we would call them or two classes together. So that's a really interesting uh, structure. And like you say, it gives you a little bit of freedom uh, in that marble activity. Immediately, what comes to mind is a, a colleague in my district, uh, Dylan Langlois, uh, who who I know sometimes listens to the podcast. Uh, he used to do some catapults and he used yeah. to have a marble activity. So sounds like, you know, you and him would probably really hit it off uh, with some of that work. So that is fantastic. Thanks for giving us some context. And uh, I think I've said it before on the podcast, but I was born in Quebec. Uh, I, I don't have the awesome, awesome accent, sadly, because I moved away when I was really young. Uh, but what a beautiful city Quebec City is. So before we go any deeper, though, uh, Guillaume, we're wondering, can you help us take us back into your own experience as a math learner and uh, tell us, what is that math moment that sort of resonated with you or pops into your mind when you think of math class? Um, I would have to use to, to have two moments. The first sure. one is when I was in, that would be eighth grade, uh, during my time there, Every time uh, before the end of a, uh, I would say a semester, like a three months period, we have a, a report card every three months. And within those three months, I would always get one answer wrong, but only one every three, three months. And because of that, at the end of the year, I would not even want to look at my uh, report card because I was always saying, well, I could have done better, but in fact, would I have really done better? Was I really a, a, not a, a perfect uh, um, score? That My score was not perfect, but I think that I did understand everything correctly. And mm. sometimes I was wondering why would like one small calculation mistake stop me from getting an A in my class? Mm -hmm. Or what not an A, but a 100% <clears throat> in my class. And I right. remember that the last the semester or three months period of the year, I just took the report card and just threw it in the garbage because I was tired of always getting a near perfect score, but not getting it because of a small mistake. And right. when I decided to become a teacher at the end of the of high school, I didn't choose math because of that. 
Hmm. I was supposed hmm. to become a, a chemistry and physics teacher. And hmm. just because of that relation that I that was developed, that I was developing with Matt, with always trying to get the perfect score and never were being able to get it. And hmm. that is something that I'm trying to get as far away as possible with my students right now. Hmm. Uh, so now I'm not evaluating with percentage anymore. I'm using A, B, C, D, and E as a, as a way to show the kids, well, you may have done a little mistake, but I can understand that you are in control of that concept and you are really, really good hmm. using it, even if you're not perfect using it. Right. So that would be one thing. And the other thing would be I... It's it's funny because it's not even in a, in a math class, but the person that helped me become what kind of math teacher I am I am now is an economics teacher, hmm. and because she was always trying to have us do real hands on things with the maths and with the different concept that she was teaching, and that's what I like to do with math because. I'm teaching grade 10, and I don't know if for you in Ontario, but here, in, starting at grade 10, we have lots of abstract concepts mm -hmm, to teach. Definitely. And sometimes it's pretty hard for the kids to be able to see where that could be useful. And, and so I like to do activities like the rent activity I just talked about to make sure that they know that not exactly who is using that knowledge in real life, but there is application of that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. I like those two different memories uh, that are sticking with you for those two, you know, very specific reasons. Uh, and I think you've very nicely articulated how they've impacted your, your style, your philosophy of teaching. And I think I think we all kind of do that a little bit uh, by taking, you know, our memories of what we've experienced in using that to shape what we like and what we don't like about the education system and how math is taught or how we believe math should be taught. Guillaume, I'm, I'm curious a little bit here about how, so you said that you've tried to, in, in the assessment piece, uh, memory that, uh, that you're, you know, you're, you're trying to grade in a different way. I'm curious what your old self would have felt like in that class. So imagine taking your old self who's shooting for the 100% hmm. uh, report card and throwing it in the garbage. If it doesn't get a hundred percent, that student is sitting in your class right now. Uh, how do you think that student is feeling right now? Oh, interesting. Uh, I do have students like that in my class that are always aiming for the perfect thing, but mm -hmm. sometimes when they do small mistakes and I can, as a teacher, show them that I do understand that is a minor mistakes that maybe in an other a problem, they would not have done it. And that doesn't really matter with how they handle that a mathematical concept. Mm -hmm. So they're able to get an A, and if they get all A's during the, 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 the semester, at the end of the semester, I give them a 100% anyway. So right. I'm allowing the kids, we always say that, that we need to uh, allow and even uh, make sure that kids, that they know they can do mistakes. Mm -hmm. What I do now is I make sure that those mistakes are not what is showing on the report card at the end. And if they have understand, even if they had some small mistakes, they can still get 100% at the end. Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting because when you were sharing that memory, you know, what sort of resonated with me, I started to think about how we often really think about those students who are struggling in math as like why reporting and evaluation and, and a lot of the things, the practices that we use uh, have have maybe hindered um, some students' perceptions of themselves as mathematicians and so forth. And you've kind of opened my eyes to the other end of the spectrum that, you know, I, I don't think most would think, hey, listen, like you, you almost got perfect. Like, what's your problem? You know, like, what what's your problem? Aren't you happy with that? But in reality, it's like every student, 
is looking at that and they're, you know, they're, they're perceiving it differently, right? So if you're a student who has always received a 50% or has always received an 80% or has always just been just short of that perfect, it's like, it has a different, it has a different, you know, uh, effect on, on your interpretation. So it, it was almost like, you know, I was imagining you know, your situation where it was like, you, you threw it out. It was like, you knew what was coming yep. and it was like, what, how helpful was that for you? Right. It, it was almost unhelpful exactly. uh, because you knew what was coming. It, it didn't help you push your thinking further. If anything, it, it actually hindered you. It actually sounded like maybe you moved away from mathematics, um, you know, maybe thinking it, it just wasn't right for you. So, you know, that for me is, is sort of a big epiphany that I've had here. And uh, it really, pushes towards this idea of how we as educators, not just in mathematics, but I think specifically in mathematics, um, we we tend to struggle with assessment and evaluation pro policies more so than some of the other subject areas. And, you know, I'm wondering before we dig in and, and dive deeper here, I'm wondering what would you say would be like maybe a, a quick win for you uh, in this area of assessment and evaluation, it sounds like you're thinking differently about, and I think we're going to be talking about a pebble that's related to assessment and evaluation. So I'm wondering any quick wins that you can share, maybe something that you've tried or or something that has worked well for you uh, either in the past, or maybe it's something more recent. Well, I try often not to use marks at, at all with the kids. So they get their, their uh, let's say they have an evaluation they get the evaluation, it's full of comments, but there's no marks. And that way they can focus on what they did right and what they did wrong, instead of only focusing on the percentage at the end. I got an 80% mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I don't look at my at my work anymore. And mm -hmm. a lot of times I'm gonna, uh, I'm doing that with the kids, I'm just giving them their exams. And they're asking, oh, can I know how, how much I got? And no, I cannot tell you how much you got. How much do you think you should get for that work that you just did? And most of the times they are pretty, um, how would you say that, hard with themselves. And they mm -hmm, give mm -hmm. them lower score than what I wrote in my uh, report, uh, in my grade book. But uh, it's, it helps them focus on, what is important and the, what we want to do is to learn, not mm -hmm. to get uh, high scores. So that's something that I do often with the kids. I'm not saying that it's easy because some of the kids right. are working for the grades and he wants the grades and parents are writing me and I want to know how much did my kid get. But mm -hmm. I said, did your kids, did your kid present you the exams with the comments on it? Yes, well, that's what they have to work on. And that's what is the important thing. And in mm -hmm. my classroom, a, a kid can always retake an exam or, or show me that the marks they got is not a good appreciation of what they are able to do. So without having any marks, they can say, well, I did a lot of mistakes in that area. Let me show you that I, that I can do that. And that way, I don't know what my mark is, but I know that I I can improve it. Hmm, so that's right. something that I like to do. It's not easy, like I said, because some of the parents are not uh, really, really uh, uh, for that way of thinking right. and working with the kids. Yeah, no, uh, totally. I, yeah. I was I was just gonna mention, like you know, I, that it's so interesting because kids do so many other things in, in everyday life that, you know, parents are interested in and may, maybe it's sports or it's music or it's art or it's some other, you know, thing. And it's not grade based and it's based more on feedback, right? You know, you hear what the coach says and you, you know, you watch what, you know, your, your child's doing out there. And, and yet it's almost like, you know, parents, because they've been through the system as well, but also it's like you're, they're trained that this is how it happens. It's almost like, just tell me the mark so I don't have to worry about it. It's like, just mm -hmm. that will allow me to not have to worry about it. And and so I, I totally see where parents are coming from there, but I want to just, you know, do a little hat tip to you for sort of sticking to your guns there and, and really trying to help them see 
that actually, you know, this feedback actually goes a lot further for students because the reality is, is it, it kind of doesn't matter what that mark is, whether it be really high, like you were experiencing or really low, like I was describing it really, what matters is what's the next step. And like, we all need to be working on a next step. And I, I fear when a, a parent sees a 90, the next step is good job. And that's it. Right. Versus, you know, a student who has a 50 and then it's like, get the tutor, you know, it's like um, emergency, but in reality, you know, either of those options isn't that helpful. It's like, what's really helpful is exactly what the next step should be. And it sounds like, you know, you're working towards that in your practice. So, uh, congrats to you and the, uh, go the ahead. Yeah, keep going. Well, you're comparing that with training and I'm also, a. uh, a coach. I coach um, air rifle and air pistol shooting. Oh yeah. And we get the same problems there because at the end of the day, they shoot a score on over six hundred, and their parents are always saying, "Well, you shoot, you shot uh, uh, five eighty. You should have done better." But five eighty is really, really good. And doing something better, just saying that, it's not something that we can do. You have to work on your technique. You have to work right. in your <clears throat> mental state. You have to work on specific thing. And then the score is going to change. Mm. And it is the same mm -hmm. thing in school. Saying that you should have got 80%. It's not the same thing as make sure that when you're uh, uh, calculating equation, you make sure to, uh, to, to, to respect the order in which the calculation has to be done. That's mm. something the kids can work on. Just trying to get the the grade to go up, that's not something you can work on. Mm -hmm. Guillaume, I'm uh, I'm curious what is what you're seeing from the students uh, when you are using this style of assessment with them. So you're you know you're holding back uh, that those marks. You're 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 giving the feedback. What have you seen in terms of? improvement um i'm i'm sure you didn't start your career like this is that is that correct right so you've got this like comparison uh that you can kind of refer back to and like hey i used to do it this way now i do it this way i'm curious what you're noticing as a benefit from doing this with the students like you're 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 telling us how you do it but i'm curious what the kids like what what improvement have you seen like can you give us some details on that improvement I, I know there's lots of teachers listening going like i i'm very curious about this part um i would not say that i've seen improvement in every student that's for sure but mm -hmm. for the students that are engaged and i want that wants to do better that's a way for them to know what to work on instead of just saying i have to work on everything like what you said, we need a tutor. What is the tutor going to work on? We mm -hmm. don't know. We need a tutor. Right. Right. So that way now at the end of the exam of the 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 grading uh part of the of the work, they know what to work on. And if I have a, a kid that is doing, let's say, less well than everyone else, the comments on his paper are going to be different than everyone else. I won't. I'm not trying to get him to go to 100%. Like you said earlier, I'm trying to get him to go to the next step. Right. So everyone gets comments on their sheets. Everyone knows what to work on, but they have what to work on according of, on where they are right now. Right. But right. it's the kids that were only shooting for the marks and they just take their paper and say, oh, I don't know how much I got. Some of them, they just, they don't look at the comments, but they would not have looked at the comments anyway. So at least now I, I'm trying to focus them on the important thing and say, well, you want to improve your marks that you don't know what it is? Work on that. Come back and see me. I'm going to reevaluate you. And if you change what I wrote on the paper, on, on, the, on your exam, that, that way you're going to be able to raise your marks, even if you don't know what it is. Mm, I love it. I love it. And, you know, you're, you're kind of highlighting this idea as well that, you know, with assessment and evaluation, if the assessment and the valuation is, I'm going to call it like valid, like if it's actually real, it's true, it's actually done well, 
you know, it's very difficult for a student to go from whatever that number was anyway to, you know, 20% higher. Like that's a really hard thing to do if it's true and, you know, real assessment and evaluation, because as you mentioned in your, your air rifle example, that, you know, it's unlikely that, you know, you're going to go from missing the target completely to suddenly you're just like a laser, you know, and you're, (laughs) you're hitting the target every time it's going to be a gradual and, you know, you, you have to make those, those steps and those shifts. So, um, you know, bravo to you that, you know, you're on this journey. It is a hard journey as well, as you've articulated that, you know, it's not an overnight thing where like all of a sudden every student wants to get better and they all want to take advantage of this, you know, this feedback and they're all going to use it, but it definitely points us in the right direction. So just like for our students, we can, as educators expect things to go, you know, 180 immediately it's going to be you know sometimes we're going to overshoot or or over align and we're going to have to you know try to find that balance so my wonder for you is what would you say is a, a current uh, struggle what's a current pebble in your shoe right now um i know that this is sort of like where your head is at in terms of trying to improve in your own teaching practice um where is the pebble sort of uh, appearing right now in your assessment and evaluation practices um, I'm wondering when I evaluate my students and let's say I'm teaching about, um, I don't know, uh, calculating means and kids are doing mistakes that are not uh, with what I'm, they are not aligned with what I'm trying to evaluate. They have some concept from previous years that are not really 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 good uh, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that they are not good with them and they do mistakes on those years but I'm trying to evaluate what they're doing this year so what part of, of our evaluation mm. uh, should be on those things should I say well that was a mistake from grade 10 uh, grade 6 and you already passed grade 6 so I'm not taking care of it or then I would not do that, but just to see what would be able, or I would say, well, you don't get the answer. See, if you don't get the answer, that means that you are not able to do math right now. So I'm going Mm -hmm. to penalize you a lot for that mistakes. So those are the two extremes, but where should we be between those two? Got it. So what I'm hearing is you're, you know, you, you got a piece of evidence from a student you're looking at it and you notice that they're making a continued mistake on a skill that you're not necessarily talking about. It's not like you're not necessarily uh, looking at to give feedback on and and it's preventing them from getting the right answer. Is that correct? Exactly. And Got it. not only once, but I can see that that mistake is coming back and back and back. But when I'm looking at me, my evaluation grid, it's not something that it is in it because it's not a grade 10 skill that they should that I should evaluate. Mm-hmm. It's something that should have been mastered already by the kids. Right. Guillaume, what would you like to do in this situation? Hmm. Mm, good question. When I'm trying to get the kids to learn stuff, that's something I want them to learn. In a perfect world, I would like the kids to say, well, that's the third time that Guillaume is telling me that I'm doing that mistake, that it's not something that we are working currently on, but something that we did work on, let's say, three years ago. And I really need that to be to become efficient so I can prove that I'm that I do know what we are talking about right now. Mm-hmm. So that's what I would like the kids to 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 figure Got out it. by themselves. So, well, I need to work on that. And I'm going right. to go and talk with Guillaume to ask him, well, what can I do, even if it's outside of the class I'm teaching right now, but what can I do to make sure that I don't repeat those mistakes again and again and again? Mm-hmm. Right. When you're when you're looking at that piece of evidence and you're about to write the comment um, on what they're going to do next, um, what 
what have you set up? What are your look fors? Uh, just I know that it's specific to different, you know, different topics, different concepts, different skills. But generally, like, what are you looking for on, say, that piece of evidence before you write that comment? Um, now, um, now, what I mean by that is yeah. to classify. I'll classify a little bit more. It's, it's, you know, when you, when we all teachers know when we see a piece of evidence to go, yeah, they got it right, or no, they don't, or like this is our professional judgment that comes into play yeah. after our experience, right? Like we can see solutions, we can know where some mistakes happen, we know when they clearly demonstrated their understanding and and uh, of this particular concept. Um, so you know what to look for. But when you're going to write a, a, a piece of feedback to them, um, if, if you're, I think we want to think about like, what are we looking for so that I can give them the right feedback? So I guess my, my question here is like, when you're about to write that feedback, what are you looking for to write that piece of feedback? Um, good question. When I'm writing that feedback, Sometimes I wrote, I write it exactly our, our, as I'm telling, I would have, I will tell the kids, I would say, I can see that what I'm teaching you right now, you understand, but because you don't know how to add fractions, you are not able to get the right answers. Mm. So, and that's where my pebble is. If I wanted to, like, what is, what is asked of me is, is that kid good in grade 10 mm -hmm. or the grade 10 skills? This kid is perfect, but he gets no right answers. Yeah. So right. that's what I'm trying to get the kids to figure out. If you would like to go back on those skills and make sure that you get them and you are able to work with them, it's going to show up with getting the right answers every time mm -hmm. even if it is not something that i'm teaching you right now right right i'm i'm sort of you know trying to think of an analogy and i'm thinking almost as uh you know uh you know thinking about like an advanced you know biking course or something <laughs> like that you know where you're you're trying to become more efficient and you're trying to get faster as a biker and you're trying to, you know, you, or, or maybe it's in a sport and, you know, you're taking power skating classes and, you know, you're getting better in those power skating moves, but your stick handling hasn't, you know, hasn't like caught up to your speed. So, you know, you're kind of looking at it going, but wait a second, it's a power skating course and all of those things are going well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But ultimately at the end of the day, you're still unable to have like you're you're not a complete hockey player yet. And in math in particular, you well, know Yeah, go ahead, John. I was I was just gonna interject on this as analogy here on on some some kind of uh a level that the student thinks about themselves as well. Hmm. Right. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like you're saying they've done these things over here, but they're not the complete hockey player yet. And and I'm wondering like, does this, does the, does the hockey player also not feel that confidence that they, they, they know that they're not a complete hockey player yet because they're experiencing this, this lack of skill or lack of like deficiency somewhere along this line. Right. So, so if we kind of translate that to a student. It's, it's when you are thinking about assessing or writing this piece of feedback in its and Are you looking for confidence in a sense that says, look, are, is my, am I seeing consistent evidence, um, you know, in the products and the observation in the, in the, in the, conversations that the student is confident and consistent can demonstrate the skill I'm looking for. And I think we have to be clear on what skill you're looking for, right? Because then, so you can say, look, I've got my, I got my grade book. I've got my, my comments ready to go. I'm looking on this particular skill. How are they doing on that? Like this, this is something I remember battling, like, a long time ago with like communication marks, you know, how do I, how well are kids communicating ideas? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, some questions I'm looking for how well they explain and communicate their thinking. 
In some questions over here, I might be looking at how well they demonstrate the understanding of mathematics on this skill. So I, that's why I asked that question about what are we, what are, when we're looking at the feedback, we have to, I think, focus and pick what's the thing I'm looking for here. And then I can write my piece of feedback. And then I can also say how well a student is doing. And that translates back to the student also feeling like they might themselves know they're not confident in this area and, mm -hmm. and you know, because they're getting this feedback, you know, consistently. And so it's like, I'm not the complete hockey player yet. I have to move forward there. And they're also feeling like that because they have this deficiency in these areas that they need to kind of spruce up. And so we're giving mm -hmm. them that right comments over here, but we know we got to push them to kind of pull this all together. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm wondering too, and th this is something interesting that, you know, I'm, I'm picturing that hockey example or analogy and, and thinking about in math class. And I, I wonder if there's almost like two buckets that we have to think of as well. So John, you're talking about sort of like, what is it we're looking for? And in this, what we're looking for thought or, or, you know, reflection, you, I, I feel like you almost have to look at, okay, is this skill, is this concept or skill? I want to see if the students, what they know, understanding can do with it. Is there something happening here that actually is hindering them from being successful with this new concept or skill? And if the answer is yes, then I, I, at, in this current moment, and maybe I'll change my mind by the time, you know, I speak about this again next week or next month, you know, I almost feel as though that is connected. It's like those are together, like without that other piece, this piece isn't going to work well, like you're never going to be successful with that piece. So, for example, you know, let's say Pythagorean theorem, and it's like, you know, you you seem to understand the sides and you seem to understand, you know, the two shorter legs and you see that, you know, the third side, like you understand all of these things. You even understand like where to substitute values into the, the formula for Pythagorean theorem. But it just seems like every time you try to square a number, you're doubling the number instead. And like, it's like, even though that concept itself isn't Pythagorean theorem, but it's like essential for it. I feel like there's like something that kind of keeps it glued at the hip. Like it's like, that's got to have some sort of, you know, uh, connection there. However, on the other hand, if there's this other concept that's going on and let's say they make an error, maybe it's a careless error. Like I think careless errors are very common, like where, you know, maybe they just make a silly computational error or something. Uh, that's not like, like the, the, the concept, the understanding of the concept isn't hinged on it then that might be maybe a separate scenario. You might still provide some feedback, but you're sort of like, overall, you're like, they've got this, you know, exactly. they've got this. So right. I wonder if that's maybe something that, you know, when you're looking at these problems, if you almost put it through this first filter of like, is this error, is it actually directly connected to this idea in, in that without this, without this understanding, your success with this new idea is going to forever be hindered? Uh, and if that's the case, it's almost like we need to ensure that, you know, this is addressed like, you know, sooner than later. And if it's something maybe unrelated or maybe it's a certain scenario or problem where, you know, it, you know, you're integrating two ideas together and it's like, you know, this idea is sort of separate from this other idea. You can see understanding here, but you can see maybe they're not understanding this particular idea. Maybe that's something that's a little more fragmented or or separate. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Like, does that help you with any sort of clarity or how do you feel there? I like the two different cases because like using the Pythagorean theorem as an example, the kid that is able to use that theorem to calculate everything as long as it is, uh, whole numbers mm -hmm. in English and like pretty oh, numbers, uh, right? Sorry. Pretty, pretty numbers. Yeah. So they're good. But as soon as I get uh, one half on, or one third for, for one of the sides, they are not able to do anything because they are, they know the, the, the theorem, they know what to do with it, but their knowledge of fraction is mm. keeping them from mm. showing what they know. That, that's an excellent example that you just well, shared of those right. two and, ideas for sure. 
and it and it definitely is and now this example kind of brings up an idea uh, you know that that i usually consider in in the, these types of situations like if you think about a rubric on the pythagorean theorem right so you're thinking about the stages of like where the students understanding lies on this it's kind of like you're thinking about like can they do it with easy numbers can they like do this with these skills and can you witness that it's like that might take up most like you might get almost all the way there with the rubric but then also like your specific example seems to be like that could be a completely separate thing going, look, I, I can witness them doing this Pythagorean theorem. But over here, I'm seeing every time I substitute into this particular problem or in this student that they're lacking some of the skill with fractions or, you know, maybe that's what Kyle's example with with exponents and multiplying like that, that part seems like if it's fractions, it's like over here on this other skill I have down here, that's a fraction skill. And I now have evidence that says we need work on fractions. And all of a sudden now I have to consider that say standard to be, mm -hmm. you know, captured over in this area versus this area. Whereas this area I'm seeing, Hey, they've got the Pythagorean theorem, but it's very clear that it's over here. We need to kind of like have that working record it over here instead. Yeah. And you know what, John, too, you know, what pops into my mind as well, which is, is a kind of a philosophical, you know, debate or discussion to have is, you know, oftentimes uh, I'm not, an, uh, I'm not sure in Quebec what this looks like in terms of your curriculum or your standards, but at some point, some standards sort of fade away, which is almost like, you know, the curriculum writer is sort of suggesting like, you know, we've, we've introduced it during these grades. We've come back to it and gone deeper. We've gone deeper. We've gone deepest. And now it's almost like assumed that it's good. So there's, uh -huh. you know, high in grade 10, for example, you might not have a, an explicit expectation or standard that says students will be able to multiply right. fractions, right? When, when you have Pythagorean theorem with, you know, with fractional side lengths, and now they have to square, you know, three fourths of a meter or whatever it might be. Now you run into this other, ch you know, challenge where you go, well, this isn't even a part of this course, but at least in my personal belief, I go, actually it is because I believe that if you're in this course, the thought is, is that we're strong with all of these ideas behind this course. And I totally understand that most students come in not strong in all of the previous, you know, prerequisite <laughs> concepts. But to me, I look at that and go, all right, I might actually create, you know, another bucket, another standard that isn't formally connected to my course, but it is something that I you want give feedback these students. Yeah. I want them to have feedback and I want them to get better in that area. And then you'd have to decide later on is that, you know, how does that impact or influence that final grade at the end. Um, but my, you know, my gut would suggest is that by offering that feedback and by students seeing that, like, hey, all these new concepts you're doing really, you know, really well with, but you you're almost hitting the ceiling. Like as soon as, like John said, as soon as those numbers, you know, turn from, you know, good looking numbers to not so great looking numbers, all of a sudden, you know, things start to crumble away. And again, that's just, it's kind of, it's kind of highlighting some challenges or some areas that we can work on, which again, is really what this is all about. It's by, right. you know, highlighting that, Hey, it's not Pythagorean theorem that you're struggling with. It's like, Hey, if we can now, when we get to that tutor, we were talking about, we have something real, we can work on here instead of just trying all these random problems and hoping more practice of random things is going to help fix the problem. And I really like, like you said, to, I have my grade 10 curriculum and now I just figure out that I need to ha add something because for that kid, that part, which is not part of the curriculum is now something that they need to work on. I really, really like that part. Right. Yeah. And, th and think about well, the, the power, uh, the power that you and your students are going to have right now, because you're working in a standards based grading environment that, you know, the way you've outlined it at the beginning of this call um, to say that you're, you know, you're giving feedback on specific skills. I'm sure you're tracking those, those skills and think about like, if you set that up, 
And now it's like we were working on Pythagorean theorem, but we hit the wall here on Pythagorean theorem because of this deficiency over here. And if we work on fixing that deficiency, and because you're using standard space grading, it's like, hey, let's give a shot at another Pythagorean theorem and let's see if that wall's broken. I love it. Yeah, that's pretty good. How how are you feeling right now, Guillaume? You know, you you came in first of all again some great successes, some great ideas, like a really, uh, I like the forward thinking in terms of your assessment and evaluation and your goals for your students like that. It's mm -hmm. very clear that that is like first and foremost, which I think is so important as educators, that you're actually trying to help students grow. You're not just teaching curriculum. You're actually looking at helping them grow. You've come with this pebble. How are you feeling um, now? You came in with this pebble, you know, where, where's your mind at now? And are there any maybe takeaways that you're going to be thinking on and, and maybe trying to put into place as you move forward? Right now, I'm, I'm going to have to think about it later on. But what now what I'm thinking is in my grade book to really, really add something else for, for something else for that kid. And when let's use the example with the fractions with the Pythagorean theorem. When they do succeed in understanding that part, I can just erase that part of the curriculum because now they're able to show me that everything right. else is good. I right. Like it. It's, it, yeah. I love it. Let's see, you're tracking like this area just so that you can provide growth. Exactly. Which is the whole, which is the whole point of what you're trying to do anyway. Yeah, yeah. it's exactly. And I really, really love that idea. I love it. Right. I love yeah. it. And yeah. I think you've, you're, you're latching onto it and exactly how we're perceiving it, where it's like, you know, ensuring students understand that this isn't like a, you know, I think sometimes students look at grading as punishment, you know, like it's like every mistake, like, and you had mentioned this in your math moment, even just about this idea of a mistake and, you know, how, like, why did that impact? So, you know, why did that influence my grades so much on these report cards? And I think students kind of look at grading in that way. So as long as that, you know, that story for students is that this is for growth and this is to help not to hurt, I think, you know, it helps you navigate maybe some of like the, the trickiness because, you know, if someone wants to go, well, wait a second, there isn't, you know, a standard that says, you know, you have to do this, this, or this. I mean, you could probably argue it that, well, guess what? We're dealing with rational numbers, you know, in this course, and they come up in Pythagorean theorem. That would be your way around it. But I, I don't even think you'd have to go down that route to, to sort of argue with someone as to why you're doing it, because I think your intention is very clear. You know, you make that very clear with students that, hey, this is a growth piece. And again, you look at it as a win that you're like, Hey, the new concepts you've got, it's the old concepts. Like you, you know, you probably had this maybe a couple of years ago and, and maybe you're, we're just a little rusty on it. So let's focus on this. So uh, I love how, you know, I could see it in your eyes that you've got some plans, you've got some yeah. thoughts on what that might look like. Uh, we're wondering, would it be okay if maybe we check in with you, uh, you know, nine, 12 months from now and sort of see where your mind's at then? Maybe that pebble has been removed, but, you know, as we always say, new pebbles, as you fix one or take one out, another one seems to pop in or something related to what you've just solved introduces another down the road. Uh, would that be okay if we check in with you and see how things are going? Of course. Awesome stuff. Uh, thanks so much, Guillaume, for uh, taking the time to chat with us. And uh, we look forward to catching up later. Thank you. All right, my friend. We'll chat real soon. Hey, friends, as always, John and I learned so much from these episodes. And uh, as John mentioned uh, before the episode, uh, we've got a pretty awesome course that's all about assessment for growth. Uh, in that course, we help to set you up, get on that path uh, from the, the beginning. So uh, mm -hmm. doing some of what Guillaume's doing in his classroom right now in terms of really trying to shift the focus away from grades. We understand there's report cards and there's things that you have to do, your district mandates, or maybe even your, your um, jurisdiction, like your province or your state might mandate certain things that have to be done. Uh, but there's a lot we can control in our classrooms. And, you know, it really uh, starts with shifting our thinking around assessment and evaluation. And, you know, while this conversation was a great one, there might be some of you wondering, how do we get going? Like, how do I actually start on this journey? It seems overwhelming. It seems different. It seems hard. Uh, we have the perfect solution for you. It is the assessment for growth course. And the first module is actually wide open. So you can go and check it out 
right now. Uh, no logins needed, nothing like that. You can dive right into the first lesson and dig in over at makemathmoments.com forward slash AFG. That's assessment for growth. So AFG is the short, short form, makemathmoments.com forward slash AFG. And uh, you can dive into it right now. Awesome stuff there. Thanks for, for sharing that, Kyle. Uh, if this is the first time, this is your first episode listening to our podcast, then uh, welcome. Welcome. And uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And we would ask you, hey, we're going to ask you to hit subscribe. Hit subscribe so that you can get all of the episodes as we publish them every Monday morning each week. A uh, new episode comes out uh early, early Eastern Standard Time uh, so that you can listen to it on the way to work. Um, if this is uh, more than your first time, it's, it's, uh, you've listened a few times, maybe you've listened to many, many of our uh, over 200 right now episodes uh, at the time of this recording, Kyle. That sounds crazy when I say that, but uh, 200 episodes, um, let, you know, welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> and uh, maybe consider leaving a review over on Apple Podcasts. Hit that review button. Tell us a little bit about what the podcast has done to influence your classroom. If you've listened to many already, you know that it must have influenced you somewhere. Otherwise, why did you come back? Why did you come back and listen a little bit longer? Uh, so please le consider leaving us a review over on Apple Podcasts. It would greatly uh, appreciate it. We would greatly appreciate it. And the teacher who has not yet listened to a podcast will greatly appreciate it because when you leave that review, it triggers the algorithm to put it in front of that other teacher who's waiting for that next action so that they can ch change their classroom as well. I love it. And uh, in order for John and I to engage in these, our favorite type of episode, the Math Mentoring Moment episode, we need friends like you to share those struggles, which means becoming a little vulnerable, opening up to us and the Math Moment Maker community, uh, but knowing in your heart of hearts that first of all, uh, you'll get some different perspectives, maybe just a, a different glimpse into your context, your situation, and you'll be helping other math moment makers, just like you who are struggling with similar problems, uh, head on over to make mathmomentscom forward slash mentor. That's make mathmomentscom forward slash mentor, where you can dig in and just give us a short description of that pebble that's currently kicking around in your shoes. And, uh, friends don't forget show notes, resources, transcripts, all of the goodies, including links to our assessment for growth course can be found over on our show notes page on the makemathmoments.com website, makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 217. That is makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 217. Friends, until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And... A high five for you.